I've been uh, with the Park Service for a number of years and at El Moro uh, uh, since about 2006. And I uh, periodically uh, come down to Tucson and spend a little time with the family, but uh, uh, most of the time I'm, I'm up at El Moro and El Malpais these days. Uh, El Moro National Monument, for those of you who have been there, you know what it looks like and what a, what a stunning uh, view it is around the El Moro Valley and, and, and the quest of El Moro. And, um, for those of you that don't, I'll give you a brief description. It's uh, about 7,200 feet, uh, the El Moro Valley, and uh, El Moro, or the, the monument, which is primarily uh, uh, the, the rock, or which is a, a classic cuesta, uh, which uh, conceals a box canyon on its interior and a plunge pool on the front. Uh, from the top, it looks uh, sort of like a triangle, the, the, uh, the, the cuesta. Uh, the north point forming uh, sort of the, the front of it, which it kind of looks like a, the prow of a ship uh, extending out into the, the El Moro Valley. Uh, you can, if you all uh, ever go onto Google Earth, you can see that pretty clearly. Uh, pre pretty pretty interesting, uh, interesting photos from above. But uh, El Moro National Monument was uh, one of the, well, was the second national monument established uh, or proclaimed by uh, Teddy Roosevelt on December 8th in 1906. It was the second national monument established under the Antiquities Act. Um, and it preserved initially just the rock and the inscriptions and uh, the significant archaeological sites. Um, they don't really refer to them specifically, but uh, kind of referencing the ones on the top. Um, since, uh, since 1906, it has expanded a number of times, first in 1917 under Woodrow Wilson and then later in the 1950s to its current 1,200 acres, which includes uh, about 160 archaeological sites as well as the, the inscriptions and now uh, some historic uh, structures that are park service and, uh, uh, for example, our uh, visitor center. Uh, but um, um, the... Uh, Lost my place. Um, <laughs> yes, the inscriptions. That's right. I knew there, there was. I knew there was some some place I was heading. Um, there are uh, petroglyphs and pictographs at El Moro, as well as 2,500 inscriptions. Uh, that the many have been documented uh, to this day. We still find some occasionally, and we still get a few new ones. Unfortunately, uh, people don't uh, pay attention to the signs. But uh, uh, as I said. Uh, the, uh, the monument was established for its significant cultural resources, inscriptions, and archaeology. And uh, of course, the Spanish inscriptions are uh, probably uh, the thing that people uh, are, are, are remember the most are often to go, to go and visit uh, the earliest ones in, in the United States, uh, starting with uh, uh, Don Juan Yonat on Yate's inscription from uh, 1605. Uh, and there are a number that go, run through the Spanish period, as well as inscriptions uh, from the uh, American period. Uh, so, from uh, starting with uh, 1849 uh, through uh, the early 20th century. Um, in 1849, uh, Simpson and Kern uh, stopped on, uh, on, on their, as kind of a detour from the uh, expedition, uh, Washington expedition to uh, punish the Navajo. And um, they made a detour to look at, uh, to look at El Moro. They'd heard uh, quite a bit about the inscriptions and a uh, little bit about the archaeology. And Simpson, who had already visited Chaco Canyon, uh, prior to that, was uh, was pretty interested in, in seeing the site, seeing wanted to see the inscriptions, but he, he really wanted to see uh, some of the archaeology as well. So that's kind of what brought them there with a guide and uh, one other person to help out with camp. But uh, really, there were only about uh, well, three or four total uh, in 1849 that visited uh, that made that stop, set up camp, and they spent about 72 hours there and managed to get all of the inscriptions. Well, at that time, all that was there were the Spanish inscriptions. Um, Actually, that's not true. There were perhaps a few from the Mexican period, and we're not entirely certain uh, what happened to some of those, but uh, there's at least one from 1836. But anyway, he was able to get through all of those, and uh, uh, subsequently the, uh, the, the place became uh, rather uh, uh, an attraction for people uh, visiting, well, visiting to see the inscriptions. I mean, it has always been a stop, a water hole, a place to, uh, to pause on the trip, perhaps between uh, uh, Acoma and uh, the Pueblo of Zuni. Uh, because of uh, the water at the plunge pool, and uh, people stopped and, and left their names along the way. Um, the plunge pool is, uh, contrary to uh, um, some of the reference I've seen, it is actually a, a tinaja or a, a water source that is, uh, uh, gets all of, its, uh, all of its water from uh, uh, flow from the rock from the top, so it plunges some 200 feet down and forms a basin. 
and uh, that's where, where the water has, uh, has been retained over the years. Um, the Park Service added a dam to that in the 1920s in order to uh, kind of bring up the water level uh, because at the time that was really the only source of water for the park. So that's what they used for the monument. That's what the uh, superintendent's uh, house, uh, that's where the water came from and that's what uh, the visitors would uh, use also when they were there for camping or uh, view the inscriptions. Uh, that pool was in, enhanced a little bit later on in the 1940s to provide, uh, to continue to provide water, which served more or less uh, until about the 1950s, when uh, the Park Service did finally get a get a well going and, and was able to get water into the, the visitor center that didn't belong to the didn't come from the pool. Uh, but the pool has uh, been, you know, a semi-reliable source for for a very long time. And if you visit there now, you'll see that it's uh, it's pretty 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 good size because of of the dam. It's uh, it kind of varies between about 7 and 11 feet deep, so it's, it's pretty substantial, draws a lot of wildlife, a uh, very nice place to sit and, and, uh, and, and contemplate. Uh, it's also kind of interesting, it can freeze over in, in the wintertime, or at least the top can, so it looks, uh, looks nice, equally nice in the, in the winter. But um, that, uh, that water source is, is what drew people to, to El Moro, and of course the trail uh, between uh, Zuni and, and Points East uh, went by there, so it was a, an excellent stopping point for expeditions and, uh, and, uh, and people just uh, making their way between the two areas. Um, so, preserving the inscriptions, that has been uh, of great concern since the, the park was established, and of course that's why it was established, to, to protect uh, uh, what, what had been, you know, people had been stopping to see for so many years. Uh, uh, because, um, well, <clears throat> like so many things, uh, vandalism was occurring even at that time. Uh, there was uh, also concern that, um, um, you know, the area would be uh, uh, become a part of a ranch and, and uh, you know, structures, uh, um, essentially development would occur around it. Uh, I, don't, I don't think they thought of it in those terms at, the, at that time, but uh, there was concern over protecting that resource. So, of course, the, uh, the monument was established. Um, and since that time, uh, we've kind of had those same kind of concerns of protecting the, the resource and trying to, uh, uh, you know, um, oh, I don't know, uh, keep it, well, they, they fenced it to keep grazing out, which was, uh, I think, initially resisted, but uh, 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 especially when uh, the grass became better there than in other places along uh, the El Moro Valley. But um, uh, one of the uh, main concerns of uh, the early superintendents at El Moro, starting in the 1920s, was the deterioration of the inscriptions. Um, they seem to be wearing away uh, through the process of weathering, which is no surprise. It's a, it's a sandstone, a very large sandstone promontory, and the sandstone is very soft. Um, you know, the, uh, the quality of that stone that made it so easy to, to inscribe your initials in or your name or date also make it uh, very soft and, and, and subject, easily subject to erosion. And so uh, early efforts, in, in fact, um, uh, starting in 1926, the, the first superintendent uh, tried uh, a couple of uh, preparations of wax and, and, other, uh, and other things to, uh, to try and uh, protect inscriptions. And uh, he had the foresight to create his own in, in one of the areas on a boulder and, uh, and, 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 and apply some of these, these applications to these, uh, these new inscriptions of his own. And, the inscriptions uh, say, colorless coatings protect inscriptions. And so he tried a different coating on each of those words. And so that, that may be the first example of, uh, of preservation in New Mexico that, that we know of, at least of, of that type. Um, he did try some of his uh, preparations on, uh, on, so, on some of the other inscriptions later, including on Yate's um, inscription, you know, the, the one that so many people uh, come to see uh, first and foremost. Um, since that time, we've done a lot of other things, uh, well, a lot of other things and a lot of similar things to try and protect the inscriptions. Uh, uh, concern uh, really be, uh, started to develop uh, uh, over by about the mid-1920s when uh, there was a lot of loss of inscriptions around the pool, um, possibly because they raised the, the water level. And um, I think maybe I'll talk about that a little bit later when we get into the panel portion, but um, um, by late 1970s, 1980s, and certainly in the 1990s, um, we began to have uh, conservators at El Moro on a regular basis. And um, their first order of business was to uh, go around uh, all of the inscription panels and to sort of assess them, but uh, prioritize which types of inscriptions needed uh, their attention the most. And so 
Um, between a period of about um, 1991 and about 1996, they, uh, they uh, looked at uh, uh, 610 inscription panels and, and photographed them all, uh, and uh, then came back and uh, then did treatments on uh, inscription panels that uh, were, had, the, had the greatest need, essentially, the, the greatest um, loss, uh, loss of erosion. And, and kind of the way they made that determination initially and sort of leading into what, why we're doing this project is that um, we had no way initially to determine um, the rate of erosion or what really to monitor the change. Um, we had photographs going back to the 1890s, uh, the Lummis photographs, and, and a lot of those I've seen, I'm just talking about that a moment ago, most of those tend to be uh, a photograph of the rock, uh, the front of inscription rock, well, primarily the North Point, that prow of the ship that sticks out into the El Moro Valley. And so it's, it's, a nice, it's a nice scenic shot, but it doesn't tell us much about the, uh, the photographs up close. Um, in 1955, um, there was uh, all of the all of the inscriptions. Uh, I want to say all. I think the majority were documented, and so that kind of provided a baseline that the conservators started with was that 1955 sequence. And so from there, they went to um, photographing in 1991, and um, and subsequently photographed the same groups in the same spots over and over, and. Um, in doing so, they noticed a number of different types of uh, damage that were, that were uh, from resulting from weathering that was occurring uh, to to the inscriptions. And they, um, on the photographs, they made overlays, and they would mark on the overlays what the what the damage was to uh, inscriptions. And um, for example, spalling uh, was one of the more frequent ones. Uh, salt disturbance, um, even insects. Uh, uh, granular uh, degradation, where it just slight, slightly erodes. Um, uh, we even have accumulation uh, from uh, clay wash, so it's erosion from a, the top of the rock that washes down over the inscriptions. Um, cracks, um, let's see, uh, and well, of course, just uh, channeling from, from water runoff. Um, I think initially, in, in starting certainly in the 1920s, the greatest concern was this slow and incremental um, degradation of the inscriptions, the fact that the surface appeared to be wearing away, and I think that that's where a lot of the f focus was, and perhaps that's why they used things like paraffin and um, you know, other types of chemicals to sort of try and provide a protective coating over the inscription. And um, that's um, you know, there, it's not without problems. Uh, it uh, can can help, and in some cases it did, according to the the, the conservation reports from the 90s. They thought that. Uh, Perhaps some of the treatments that were done early on uh, may have may have done some good, um, but uh, as is often the case, if you apply something to a, a surface uh, that it, say weak sandstone that's crumbly, and in this case the El Moro sandstone is high, it's a very high clay content, and when it does absorb moisture, it uh, can kind of stresses it can um, expand and correct contract, and when that happens over and over again, it kind of break breaks down. So if you have a surface treatment that covers perhaps just one inscription, that whole piece might eventually come off because the inscription might stick to the, uh, the application, the, the preservative that you put just on that, uh, that particular point. And so that was uh, of one concern also about, well, you know, how much, uh, how much of this stuff should we put on in terms of treatment? So, um, um, well, not a, lot of, not a lot of those paraffin treatments were done. Um, so, Jumping ahead in time to the 19, well, to our uh, to 2000s, we uh, uh, decided that uh, we could try and put in some funding through the Park Service's uh, cyclical uh, process of getting funding, uh, funding requests, and um, and uh, thought we'd try and address this uh, problem of um, erosion rate because, like I said, the conservators had been working on this from for a number of years, trying to determine. Uh, loss and you know what what kinds of things not only what kinds of things were affecting the inscriptions but uh, how fast they're going away. Uh, so this project was initiated to use lidar scanning for for that uh, process to give the conservators uh, something that they could uh, use and assess loss for the very first time. And I'll I'll let Doug get into to that component of it. But before I um, uh, go on to that or let Doug go on to that. Uh, I would say that just uh, that 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 fact of, of change that we see in photographs uh, at El Moro, not just the the ones that were taken in the 1950s and subsequently by uh, by conservators, but uh, you can really see it even from some of the the um, oh well I, I guess popular uh, 
uh, culture of things that have been, um, well, I don't know if anybody's if you've ever seen that movie, Four Faces West. It's a Western with Joel McRae. Well, he stands at the north point of uh, Inscription Rock, and, and he's talking to uh, some, of the, some of the cowboys and the heroine in the movie, and, uh, and one of them is talking about how his grandfather had come by and, his, and had left an inscription there. And, and it's, um, you know, I don't know, it's an interesting scene, but primarily for where they're standing, because they are standing right on the north side of the north point, and there are a couple of inscriptions there that are just crystal clear. There's one that is a, has kind of a frame around it, sort of looks like a rope, someone carved a rope. And then there's a second one that has that same type of carving on it. If you go there today, that smaller one is almost gone. Almost can't see it. And that movie was made in 1947. And the other thing that's very surprising there, and also perhaps very significant, is that all of the inscriptions that they were standing in front of, and there are probably I don't know, 50 or 60 in that one panel are really hard to see. It's very dark and uh, they've been covered all with lichen. And when that movie was made, there wasn't any lichen on the rock at that time. So something has changed in that spot. It's become wetter. The lichen sure like that spot. And so these are, you know, uh, some of the things that, uh, that the conservators uh, that we're all looking at uh, in our efforts to try and preserve these inscriptions because it's you know, not just weathering, not just incremental erosion, but there appear to be a number of things going on. And um, maybe we can talk about that after we okay. get into this a little bit. All right. Well, my involvement started in, in 2005, and um, it grew out of um, a desire to use these new technologies in geospatial positioning, um, particularly LIDAR, to come in and document the glyphs. And this was set up through a thing called the Cooperative Ecosystem Study Unit, which is a really interesting way of the Park Service being able to hire universities or not-for-profit research organizations to do, um, to do real science on national parks. And this was all coordinated through Chris Doerr at the, at the first, um, who is an expert in geospatial modeling and, and had a lot of expertise in applying laser scanning and archaeological context from a burial project that statistical research had done in California. And so um, the, the idea was that the center would hire, hire um, someone to run the scanner, and we would coordinate the data analysis and, and see if we could, after multiple years of scanning, um, see what we could see in terms of uh, loss or accretion on these, these inscription surfaces um, through the scans. And I guess I should take a, back, a step back and describe LIDAR just a little bit. Um, and I've got on their second page of the handout, um, there's a picture right in the middle of uh, the Skip Howe, our, our uh, scanner operator, looking through the, the scanning device. And um, for starters, there's always acronyms. Um, LIDAR uses lasers. So LASER stands for Light Amplification Through the Stimulated Emission of Radiation, which is a fancy way of saying that uh, electrically you stimulate some, something like a crystal or a gas and that causes that crystal or gas to start emitting photons. And if you set it up just right, the photons will all be aimed in exactly one direction. And therefore, that light is called coherent. And you can do fun things with coherent, like, like measure the amount of time that it takes for a pulse to leave the emitter, get reflected back, and return to a receiver, which for 30 years was really the basis of um, the really high-tech total stations that we all in archaeology were using to map all of our sites. So this sort of electronic distance measurement by, by bouncing lasers back and forth off of things was first. And then people got the bright idea, well, hey, we could use laser light like radio waves. And where in radio waves, you have radar, which is ranged amplitude. Uh, I'm going to lose it. <laughs> it's, it basically means um, with, with radar, you're making a map with radio signals. With LIDAR, you're making a map with, um, with light. And the, light, the LiDAR scanner basically sends a pulse of light across an area, senses the return of that light signal, measures the amount of time it took for it to bounce back and forth, and determines how far away that exact point was that the light bounced off of. And by really clever um, optics and geometry and computing, um, the, LiDAR, the LiDAR sensor returns not just the, the distance to the point, but it generates a XYZ point in three-dimensional space. So it can figure out exactly how far away the point that it just bounced a bit of light off of, how far away it is, um, how high it is up off the same plane that the instrument's on, and, and in what direction on the horizontal plane the instrument's on. And so um, with a good total station um, out working on a site, you know, if you could collect four or 500 points in a day, you, you considered yourself to have done a great day mapping. 
Um, the LiDAR unit that I started working with would shoot a million XYZ points in 20 minutes. Um, and so it goes from a situation where you're dealing with not enough data <laughs> to a situation where you're dealing with more data that you can almost possibly handle. Um, and so for each of the scans that we would do, um, uh, at, at, when we got to Elmoro, each scan was shooting a million XYZ points in a space of about 10 centimeters by 20 centimeters. Um, and the scanner was billed as being accurate to within um, probably about a third of a millimeter. And so we um, started this project by um, bringing in a, a geospatial mapping team, because the first thing we needed to do was to position all of the panels in three-dimensional space. And if you look at uh, the first page of the handout, it's got a little outline of inscription rock, and it shows the locations where all of these panels were. On each of the panels, we placed a, a cluster of mapping targets. And if you turn back to the second page, you can see these little uh, mapping targets. They're just little bullseyes, essentially, that we wanted to make small enough so that they wouldn't be visually obtrusive to people touring the park, but that we could glue them onto the rocks so that they would stay there from year to year, and they would serve as a way to tie the, the, to tie the um, mapping data into real-world coordinates. So the entire project was tied in with um, really expensive military or survey-grade GPS uh, scanners that positioned every, every bit of what we were going to be doing in exact XYZ three-dimensional space. And so we had a really precise way of, of mapping and measuring um, how the panels would change through time. And then we went out and did the laser scanning on each of the individual panels um, in 2006, 2007. And then we waited again until 2010 because I had this feeling that expecting to see, be able to see changes from year to year might be a bit much. So we decided to, to wait a couple of years and do the final scan in 2010 so we might have a, a better hope of gauging some of the processes. Um, I expected that uh, five months of, of processing time would be enough to um, get this data analyzed so that I'd be able to sit here tonight and tell you all about it. <laughs> and uh, well, um, I'm happy to say that we got results yesterday at about 3 o'clock. <laughs> So this is brand new data. This is, this is what we'll be sharing tonight. Um, Steve just heard uh, two hours ago. And you'll be, you'll, other than Steve, you'll be the first to hear it. Um, so what I thought we'd do next is um, sort of go scan, scan panel by scan panel and just talk a little bit about each of the panels and the, the, some of the history behind them. And uh, the first panel was, uh, we called it the Sitgreaves panel. And yeah. Steve, if you want to. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, yeah. I, Trying to remember my panels here. We uh, yeah we started uh, kind of at the south end of uh, Inscription Rock. Uh, at uh, Sitgreaves panel is number one, and that's uh, that's where close to a place called Nine Pine Cove, which used to be the old campground at El Moro in the 1950s. A uh, very very pretty area, uh, Nine Pine, because of the big ponderosa pines there. And uh, Sitgreaves uh, and his party uh, were trying to establish a wagon road uh, from Albuquerque uh, through down to the well to the Colorado River and on to California. And in 1851, they passed by Omoro and stopped and camped, and uh, they left uh, left their names behind. Uh, Sit Greaves, uh, which is one of the scans you'll see in that handout, uh, that's one of the names that we scanned. And uh, several others of his party uh, are also present uh, on that panel. Uh, Woodhouse, who was the doctor, and um, I believe uh, Kern, Richard Kern. I don't know if Richard Kern shows up on that, but he was also on that expedition uh, as the uh, artist naturalist. Uh, Artist explorer. There's also a glyph called Old Punk, which I have no idea what it means. Um, then there was panel two, which was the panel um, actually sort of situated over the, the pool edge. Yeah, yeah, and that's uh, that uh, that area uh, right around the plunge pool uh, uh, formerly had um, an awful lot of inscriptions. Uh, now, uh, while well, this one O'Doherty that uh, shows up in the uh, in the um, handout is. Um, I don't really know anything about that person. Uh, most of the inscriptions that I've seen from the database and some from photographs in that area are from uh, uh, the first uh, immigrant wagon train that went through there in 1859. And their inscriptions are across the rock in many locations, but quite a few at the pool. There are a number of army inscriptions there also from the 1860s and 70s. Um, just a, an interesting story on that area just because uh, well, um, we've had a lot of inscription loss around the pool, and quite likely related to the fact that the, the water level in the pool was raised in the 1940s. Um, a ranger uh, visiting El Moro in 1971 
uh, who had worked at El Moro from 1934 through 1936, uh, when he came to the pool, he said, my God, what's this place? He didn't recognize it because he wasn't used to seeing so much water in there. He said that there had formerly had been a, a, a sort of a sand bank that ran around the edge of the pool, and of course now it's water from side to side. And he also said there were inscriptions from the base of the rock to as tall as a man could inscribe on a horseback. And um, that situation has changed considerably um, uh, by 1971, and now there are still some inscriptions around the pool, and some we see here, and this is right on the edge, but uh, the large number that uh, uh, was there uh, before is, is, is no longer there. Um, the next one was E. Pin Long, which I think wins the penmanship or, or stonemasonship yeah. award <laughs> yeah. at, at El Moro. Well, yeah, often you see that one on, on websites or, or, or photographs of El Moro. It's the one that is done in just this fabulous uh, script, um, uh, someone that really knew how to use uh, his, 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 uh, his engraving tools and just made just a very beautiful uh, inscription, as you, I believe we can see. And uh, Long and the ones in the panels that are coming afterward uh, for panel three and panel four and actually panel five, all of these gentlemen, uh, Long, Engel, and Breckenridge, they were all with um, uh, uh, Beale and the Camel Corps when uh, they, they passed by um, El Moro. So in 18, between 1857 and 1859, uh, I guess Beale came back uh, on, on the road back, I think it was 1859, but he certainly came through on, well, his crew came through in 1857. He had something else to do on the first time, so he, he was not there and uh, did not leave his uh, name until he returned. So I believe that would have been in 1858 or 9. But uh, um, uh, his, uh, the, other, the other fellows, uh, Long and Angle, uh, uh, did leave their names that, that first time. And so they were there with, with, with the camels and, and mules and a number of other trying to uh, uh, establish or more formalize the, the wagon road that had already been sort of set up along the way. And the next two panels, uh, four and five, I believe also are all associated yeah. with the, the Camel Corps that was trying to move through. Mm -hmm. And so these gentlemen would have had uh, stone die tools for th carving things like gravestones. So um, these were much more formally, formally engraved in the rock. Yeah, yeah, they, uh, they're really uh, some, of, some of the better ones. It's, and it's kind of interesting, too, uh, the, uh, uh, some of our scans, uh, the long scan, uh, the one, uh, the panel that it has uh, E-Pen long, and uh, the one that is uh, angle uh, are essentially the same. They're, they're two faces of the same rock, and uh, the long inscription looks pretty darn good, um, but the angle inscription does not, and it was, I don't know, presumably made, if not on the same day, uh, pretty close to the same day. Uh, so these are you know, items of interest uh, for us. It has, has, has a bit to do with the, the ge geology and weathering there, I'm sure, but uh, uh, there's still a lot to learn about why one is in better condition than the other. And I should point out, um, I'm going to put all of these uh, graphics um, online as PDFs. Um, when the video goes up for this talk, uh, probably within about a week, um, you can go to the center's website and you'll be able to download these graphics. And, and those images are a lot clearer. I apologize that these aren't as clear as they could be. Um, the next glyph, I know we're supposed to be historically relative, but uh, Onate was not a nice guy. <laughs> yes, and he passed by El Moro uh, a couple of times. Um, the first time in uh, 1598 uh, on his way to the... Sea of Cortez, and um, uh, chose not to leave any marking, or at least none that we have found or, or, or lasted. Um, uh, but on uh, his return trip from his second trip to uh, the Gulf of California is when he made his inscription, which uh, is the one we've scanned. Uh, very busy spot, that uh, one where Anyate was. I guess everybody wanted in on it, and of course he carved right over uh, Petroglyph, so um, in fine form. And, and we really haven't talked much about the, the ancient petroglyphs sure. there, but the petroglyphs at El Moro are just, just absolutely astonishing. Um, some of the neatest examples of, of Native American rock art I've ever seen. Absolutely, yeah. Um, the next panel is called Cherty for the, the primary glyph that's labeled Cherty yes. um, with an interesting script. But yeah. yeah, but again, I think it's uh, one from the immigrant uh, wagon train from 1859. Uh, there are a number of inscriptions from that wagon train right kind of in that area. There's a little alcove uh, just a little bit south of this Cherty inscription. And, you know, I, I can, all I can tell you, if you were on the path, it would be uh, uh, just around the corner from a rock that looks very dangerous, the one with the big crack. Looks like it's going to come down any time. Uh, one of the Park Service geologists that went by to examine it said he wouldn't walk in front of it. But um, people have been for a long time. But, uh, yeah, um, that's so we think that uh, perhaps Cherty was on that wagon train. There's a very nice inscription in the Alco beyond that uh, hanging rock that uh, is by uh, Sally Fox, who was also on that wagon train, and uh, 
She left, a, her name is very hard to read. I don't know, she may not have pressed very hard with what she was uh, inscribing with or it may have uh, succumbed to weathering. But uh, uh, Sally uh, was on that on wagon train and uh, uh, survived uh, an Indian attack on the Colorado River, which took the lives of many of the people on the train as well as all of their animals. And uh, she was, uh, uh, she survived an arrow wound and uh, lived uh, into old age, but retained the dress that had the, uh, the mark from the arrow piercing. <laughs> Um, the next point, the next is the, the northeast point on, on Inscription Rock, and we've already talked about that a little bit, Yeah. yeah. Uh, how the lichens are tearing that one up. And then finally on the back side, we have the glyphs from the Bishop of Durango's visit. Yes, and uh, that was, uh, Bishop of Durango was coming up to, uh, well, to sort of extend the influence from Mexico to New Mexico, and uh, he and his companion uh, arrived in 1737, and um, their arrival was met with some resistance uh, from the Franciscans. They, they sort of feared the intrusion of uh, the Jesuits uh, into their territory. Um, but they, the bishop did uh, make a visit, did pay a visit to, uh, to Zuni and did leave his name on the rock. Okay. So we, we collated all this data and by 2008, um, we had tried to do some tests between comparing the first two years of scans. And unfortunately, we realized that our initial strategy was off. Um, and this, this was all set up as a study on how this process works. So negative evidence isn't always bad. And sometimes when you realize you've screwed up, as long as you publish the fact that you've screwed up, it's all OK. So um, one of the ways I screwed up was that um, the way that the software works in analyzing these scans, it takes one scan world or one set of points and looks at the other scan point, And it runs a statistical measure to match these two surfaces. And in running that statistical measure, it's a least squares analysis, it actually tries to, to erase any difference between years one and two because it's trying to best fit the two scans together. So already you're starting to get a little bit of squishiness in, in the analysis. And unfortunately, the other, the other problem was the way the software works is you would do on one of these one by, say, one by two meters panels, you can only scan 10 by 20 centimeters at a time. So your scans overlap, and you stitch them together into a mosaic. Well, the mosaic was accurate to within with sub-millimeter accuracy at the center of the panel. But out towards the edges, we started seeing errors of, of 1 to 2 millimeters. So it was obvious that there was going to be some problems with, with going forward on this study. So the part of the taking a couple years off was to come up with a strategy to try to deal with that. So we went back in 2010. and. Um, as usual, the technology changes. And um, the folks who we brought out to use the exact same scanner that had been used in the first two years brought a new scanner with them. And the first scanner we were using, as you've seen in that second page, was very large, very difficult. You had, to, you had to, uh, this incredible tripod that you had to be continually moving and changing the angles. This new scanner was called a Surfazer. And being a Star Trek geek, anything with the word phaser in it is good by <laughs> me. But with the Surfazer, you just set it up in the middle of an area turn it on, and it just starts spinning. And it just it spun, it shot the entire panel in what, what took us normally four hours. It shot it in 10 minutes. And you know, we knew that it wasn't going to have quite the same level of fine detail accuracy as the, as the close range scanner. But we were pretty shocked at, at um, how accurate the, the results really, really were. And that scanner actually gave us a better framework to lay all of the rest of the um, earlier scans back on top of. So that did a lot to help us pull those edges back into, back into a more accurate measurement. Um, and if we could go ahead and pass these out. I was, only had time to make about 10 of these, and they're color prints, so they're sort of expensive. Again, this, this data will be online on the center's website within about a week or so. Um, they went through, our, our scanners, our scanner operators went through and ran some basic analyses on three of the, three of the nine panels that we had been working with. And unfortunately, the results weren't very, uh, uh, weren't very encouraging. We could see changes from year to year at the scale of about a millimeter or greater. And we were, ac we were, we were confident that what we were seeing was accurate, that, that when we saw that level of change, we knew something, something that had, was different and, and, and was worth noting. So on this first page, um, there's sort of a, a, a photograph of the scanned area, a photograph of the scanned comparisons, and there's sort of this wash of blue-green information. That's mostly just statistical noise. Uh, however, there are certain little spots that are sort of bright yellow and bright red. Those do show changes on the rock. 
And we were able to zoom in on those changes so the, the final image down here shows exactly the, what's happening to that rock surface. And in every case, for all three scans, we did not see any loss of, of rock media. We didn't see any loss of the sandstone material. We saw stuff being stuck onto it. Um, and in, in this first case in panel one, um, I believe it's clay wash. But we did um, sort of zoom in on the actual Sitgreaves inscription, which is the next page. And this, the, even the statistical noise was a lot finer than we had seen before, um, which indicated to us that maybe even at a submillimeter level, um, this, this inscription had not suffered any weathering in the past four years. Moving over to um, the second panel, and there's a great photo at the top here of this, this incredible uh, dock-like structure that the, the folks at, at El Moro built for us so that we could position our scanner out over the lake surface. Um, if you look at the bottom of that, you can see all of this gunk that's been adhered to the, the inscriptions themselves. And I believe most of this is spider webs and spider egg casings and things like that. And then on the last page, on the Cherny inscription, um, we see more clay wash uh, adhering to the, the surface of the stone. Why this is important is um, if you go to any part of the rock, and we had a situation where we had a, a scanner operator accidentally brush up against the rock. When that clay wash comes down and it adheres to the surface, it becomes very fragile and very friable. And if that surface gets brushed away, you can see a little indentation where the clay wash has peeled off part of inscription rock, and that's dropped to the ground as the, as the clay wash disappears. So this clay wash process is obviously having a lot of, um, having a lot of detrimental impacts. Um, and so what we're going to do next um, is we're going to make one last stab at this data. We're going to go ahead and process all of the rest of the, the, the scanned panels to the same level of accuracy. And then we're going to take a couple of them, and rather than trying to look at this mesh that's been created by stitching all of the scanned panels together, we're going to go down and only look at, um, at the level of the, the 10, by 10, 10 by 20 centimeter scan over those three years. So in this case, we'll go back and we'll, we'll throw away all the rest of the data. We'll only zoom in on this particular glyph. And we'll use those, those detailed scans to see if we can still get, get at any sub-millimeter accuracy. Because really, we were, shooting, we were hoping to be able to see changes um, at the scale of, of less than a third of a millimeter. And one of the things I'm going to be really interested in are some possible other proxy measures that we can use to look at the shapes to see if erosion is happening in ways that might not be reflected in the removal of indi individual sand grains. But if you could picture one of these inscriptions being eroded a little bit, that shape of the letter is going to change. And it might, um, it might uh, expand slightly. Or uh, with successive clay washes, it might actually contract slightly. So we're going to be looking at those sorts of measures in the, in the small, fine detail scans to see if we can actually still pull out any, um, any super high resolution data. And that's kind of what we're, we'll be going forward with this scan data. Um, and if that doesn't work, I, I still believe, believe very strongly that this new, uh, this new surfacer, it could scan 30 times the number of glyphs we scanned in two days um, at a pop. And it's every bit as accurate as the, as the, the older scanner. So this might make a great management tool to start doing, say, every five years mm -hmm. um, to not only to be gauging for how erosion is affecting the rocks, but to um, document what's left um, so that, uh, God forbid, we lose a chunk of rock. We, we, can, we can literally actually go to a 3D printer and, and print out a replica of that rock surface and put it on display in the visitor center. Yeah. And you just talk a little bit more about that. Um, yeah, uh, well, um, just in uh, referencing the clay wash, um, that, that's, uh, you know, you can certainly see that uh, all over the rock. And in some places, it's uh, more apparent than others, such as the North Point, um, where the rock seems to be, I don't know, weaker. Um, but there, there are reasons possibly for that we'll get into in a second. But um, there are... Uh, the same ranger that uh, from the 1930s that came um, to visit in 1971 uh, was led to an inscription that is uh, fairly famous at El Moro. It has a little frame around it. It's by uh, Juan Garcia Jurado, who uh, was at uh, El Moro in um, 1709. And it's just it's a very classy looking inscription. It's very nice and very clear and distinct. And um, he, he was surprised when he got to it. So I've, I've never seen this one before. And, um, 
it had apparently been covered with clay wash um, during the time that he worked there. And so when uh, the superintendent, uh, Robert Budlong, was uh, at El Moro, he uh, in, uh, initiated a, a cleaning project and went about uh, cleaning um, the clay wash off of a number of inscriptions, including that one. So that was a, a surprise to him. But it also sort of gives you some idea what uh, how much clay wash can accumulate on some of these inscriptions, making them such that you can't see them at all. And I think we'll go ahead and uh, start the question session. Um, one thing I would like to say before we start the questions, and I don't want to embarrass Steve too much, but um, this was my first chance to work at a national park. And um, that myth about uh, government employees uh, not working very hard, <laughs> it's a myth. Uh, I have never seen a, a crew, a team of people working so hard from sunrise to sundown every day, um, breaking their backs to make sure that we could get exactly what we needed done done, and uh, I was very impressed by what was happening at Omora. Thank you. And I'll put, carry that uh, process forward. Uh, Doug Gann was at the Society for American Archaeology meetings last week, presenting a paper on a totally different topic, comes back. Doug works extremely hard as well, so <laughs> there was a good competition going on there. So um, if you've got a question, uh, raise your hand and I'll get there with the microphone, and uh, here's the first question. I think this is for Mr. Bowman. Can you describe the Park Service's philosophy toward addressing changes in the inscriptions? Would, would the park continue to wash away clay uh, uh, strata or, in other words, deal with the, the erosions? Well, um, our, of course, our, our mission is uh, preservation and perpetuity uh, uh, for objects indoors as well as those outdoors. Uh, so, uh, yes, we. We wish, to, we wish to try and preserve the inscriptions, um, but we also want to do it in a way that leaves no harm, um, kind of like uh, our conservators at the Western Archaeological Center always used to tell us, archaeologists from the field, well, if you're going to do something, make sure it's reversible. And that's sort of how we're approaching the inscriptions now. So a uh, project like Doug has been doing, this is something that really you know, doesn't uh, affect the inscriptions. We're not taking anything away from it or really jeopardizing them uh, just through the process. And so that's also the reason why we've been very hesitant about putting, um, you know, applying uh, materials, chemicals, or wax to the surface. I mean, I know it has been done in the past, but it's kind of not something we're, we're um, you know, looking at now or not proceeding with, uh, with any great speed. Um, uh, uh, applications to protect the rock surface, for example, chemical treatments or um, uh, experiments are being done on those on on rocks at uh, El Moro, but they are you know boulders that are uh, have nothing on them, and uh, we're just you know doing some testing. Um, also, for example, trying to test uh, uh, how to uh, rid ourselves of the lichen uh, problem, but um, we're finding that perhaps um, that's something we may not want to do because the lichen, when it dies, it tends to take a little of the rock surface with it when it falls. So they've experimented with a number of things, um, putting zinc chains on it to see how it reacts to zinc and uh, um, uh, also uh, bleaching them, and that seems to be the best thing. It kind of makes them white, but it doesn't seem to kill them. But um, it's possible that really the best thing is to just leave those uh, the lichens alone. There are pencils and papers on your uh, tables. If you don't feel comfortable uh, speaking into this microphone, I will be happy to convey the question. But it uh, looks like we've got someone back here. I'll be right there. Thank you for your speech. I have a question. Uh, have you compared the uh, hardness and compos composition of the sandstone in El Moro to the sim to sandstone in uh, Puglia in I Italy and Sicily, like Syracuse in Italy and also in Malta, because they have some of the same problems, but I don't know if you can use them. That, of course, depends on the composition. Um, yes, the answer is yes. Uh, not to those sites specifically, but um, samples. Um, well, a, a very fine uh, study was done by a young woman named Christine Burris, who was a student at uh, University of Pennsylvania in their uh, preservation department. And um, she uh, was very interested in the North Point, which is the place that uh, has such, um, the sandstone seems to be deteriorating more rapidly than anywhere else. It also has the highest concentration of inscriptions at El Moro, um, probably because it's the softest, easiest place to, to, to carve. But uh, she took samples from rock that does regularly fall, just 
off the point from some elevation above and, and she collected one, got a permit and collected it and she compared it with other sandstones from the area and other places in New Mexico and did uh, analysis of its, um, you know, a, geochemi a geochemical analysis and found that it is, uh, has a very high clay content and which makes it very soft and uh, it's primarily quartz sand and I forget the other material but it's composed of three things and, and, and the clay being the binder but quite a lot of clay um, and what, um, well, in, 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 the, in the course of her analysis, she found that uh, uh, all the sandstone in her test will absorb water at a, at a particular rate. You know, uh, um, you know, I can't remember exactly what the units were. Um, uh, well, anyway, uh, the Omoro sandstone was more than, you know, five times the rate of uh, some of the other sandstone that was tested. So it really absorbs water and um, perhaps quite rapidly. And uh, often, well, uh, uh, I guess when sandstone uh, absorbs water, it will uh, it can expand and it can actually deform its uh, shape, perhaps not visible to the eye, but it will actually kind of expand a little bit and as it dries out it contracts and the sandstone um, can do that a few times, maybe a hundred times, maybe ten times, uh, depending upon the stone, and then it, uh, its uh, integrity is uh, compromised and it will break or spall. So that's possibly what we see happening in some places such as the North Point is that um, we're getting water absorption that is causing this uh, fatigue to the sandstone and so it, it breaks off and we can lose inscriptions that way. So that's one kind of erosion and that's essentially erosion from within. Um, at the North Point uh, we seem to have a, a bit of a uh, problem with uh, uh, groundwater. Um, well, not exactly. This, this, the soil around the, all around inscription rock is wet from, from runoff from the rock and so it, it is retained in, in the soil. Um, and so the rock is kind of absorbing that or wicking that from the ground. And at the north point, this problem is particularly uh, acute because it's a, sort of a separate piece of rock from the rest. Vibration studies done at El Moro have shown that this, this piece of rock, which is, well, I don't know, about as high as the, uh, the very tip of it is about as high as this uh, awning. And um, it, um, it, it is, uh, it, well, it's full of cracks and fissures, and a fissure is, is, is at a fault is actually what's brought it a little bit for, forward and detached it from the rest of the rock. And water from precipitation is getting behind that, so the rock is absorbing water from the atmosphere, from rain, as well as soaking it up from the ground. So it's sort of this rising damp and this falling precipitation. The two together might be, um, you know, what, what, what causing what we saw at the, uh, the pool, which was a massive loss of inscriptions because water was in contact with the rock and sort of soaking it up. And Another question? <laughs> um, this is for Doug. Did you work directly at all with any conservators to see if they had any particular needs in terms of analysis that um, you could offer to them or you could, um, you know, your, your work could do? Everything that we did was done um, based on the conservators' needs. Um, the, the panels that we're working with were panels that have had either had conservative treatment or have had prior um, conservators look at them and they're currently tracking those panels. So the whole study was, was based on, on the conservators' needs. And we had a conservator out with us, Gretchen. Yeah, Gretchen Vakes from the Western um, Archaeological Center. Who, who was, was responsible for making sure that we had no impacts. And she was the one that actually fixed all those targets and ways for minimal impacts on the rock. Yeah. Those are removable. <laughs> but we're kind of waiting to see if they wear off, see how long it takes. <laughs> they may have additional uses in the future, exactly. so I, I hope they, they stick around. <laughs> well, they're very small. It's hard to, hard to see them. <laughs> are there other places in the U.S. where, if you will, passers-by have written their names like tomorrow? Sure. sure. Yeah. Uh, I can't think of, I can't, I can't think of any historic examples of, of really popular places where people have left their signatures, but um, prehistoric examples, uh, newspaper rocks, picture rocks here, um, Casa, Grande. Casa, Grande. Casa Grande. I mean, there's, there's places all over the United States where, where people left their marks. Uh, Capitol Reef National Monument, or is it National Park now? Uh, Muley Twist Canyon is full of inscriptions, uh, primarily Mormon settlers, same kind of thing, also carved in the sandstone. I think an entire book could probably be yep, written on this absolutely. sort of informal graffiti. <laughs> Doug, I'm going to pitch a question in here. Uh, you've done some pretty remarkable things with historical photographs and taken those into create uh, three-dimensional models of buildings. Is there any way that you can use some of the older photographs that the Park Service did 
use to document these places and marry them to this new technology? That's a, that's a field that's, that's really rapidly um, growing. And the idea is, is that photographs sort of take two-dimensional slices of, a, of, a, of, a, of the reflection of light at a particular period of time. And if you have two, two photographs of the same object, that, those photographs are carrying three-dimensional information. And there are three or four different companies and probably 20 or 30 different scholars who are working on ways to extract that three-dimensional data out of the photographs. Um, the, the short answer for your question is, if we have the camera, or if we have, if we have the camera, or if we know the exact shape of the lens and the exact distance of the lens to the focal plane of the film, that data will be accessible in the near future. Um, it's, it's um, I, I'm, let me take another step back. At a, at a certain level of accuracy, yes, we could do that right now. But in terms of getting it to the accuracy of these laser scanners, um, if we have the camera um, and could actually run some test shots through the camera, um, we're going to be able to start generating uh, data that's pretty much very close to as accurate as the laser scanners. Question along those lines. Uh, Bill? Would photographs from 1987 be a help to what you're trying to do? I still have the camera. Um, <laughs> let me get back to you on that. Well, uh, I'm, okay. I'm involved in a long-term study that's, that's evaluating these techniques, and next year I might have some better, a better answer for you. We find these inscriptions especially interesting because of something that somebody did 150 years ago. Is there any thought to what sort of inscription might be made today that would be interesting to someone 150 years from now? Um, working out at El Moro, I, I couldn't help but uh, think about the rock as a type of internet carrying data through, t through time. <laughs> um, and that, yeah, that uh, the 150 years from now, um, if our society is still around, um, they'll have more data to mine than, than they know what to do with. And most people, are, are, most people that I deal with are, are writing stuff down all of the time in ways that will carry through to the future, whether they like it or not. <laughs> El, El Moro has two boulders in the front that you can inscribe whatever you like on now. Uh, that's open. And there's also a register when you go out to the trail. You can sign your name and draw whatever you like there, too. And they keep all of that. It's interesting to look at. It is. As an aside, um, a friend of mine was work, working on a study where um, the government wanted, wanted to know, how could we leave a message for someone 10,000 years in the future? Um, what would you do to signal that this place has buried nuclear waste and it's going to be lethal for the next 10,000 years? How do you send that message? Um, look at how English has changed in just the past 600 years. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a tough question to think about when you start thinking about time, time scales of, of thousands of years. Mm -hmm. The best design I saw was a forest of spikes. <laughs> <laughs> the, architecture, the architect called it the architecture of revulsion. But he wanted to build it out of obsidian, and so, of course, that would have been really dumb because that would be a great tool source. <laughs> that question was asked of an indigenous tribe who laughed at it and said, we'll tell them. Mm. <laughs> I like that. Are there other questions in the far back there? I can't see that far back. Uh -huh. Donna. This one's for Steve. Um, does the Park Service uh, contemplate at all um, altering that pool so that it is it goes back to the way it was before, or is that a lost cause? Every day. <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we, we have talked about that, and uh, we've uh, done studies. Um, well, uh, start with uh, thought perhaps the pool was creating a sort of a perch water table along the front of Inscription Rock because before the dam was there, there was an arroyo. Um, uh, in, 18, in the 1880s, uh, the arroyo had just it was casual mention that someone had come, come by there and, and mentioned the arroyo was, was starting. And by 1932, it was 15 feet wide and 15 feet deep. So it was carrying a lot of runoff away, away from the rock. And in the 1930s, um, they uh, filled it in and recontoured the surface in front of the rock, which that alone may have had some 
made some significant changes to how, how things work around the front of Inscription Rock. And what has happened since then is vegetation has really taken over that area in front of the rock because all that moisture is now being retained in the ground there. Now other things, fire suppression and grazing have had a lot to do with the, the change in the character of the vegetation around El Moro and in the El Moro Valley. It's not that much different, it's just the density and, 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 and composition is, is now, but there's a lot around Inscription Rock. So um, the dam kind of took care of the erosion problem initially and kind of served a purpose also for providing water for the, the monument. But what we would like to do is draw the level down and, um, you know, easiest way is remove the dam. Um, but now that's a historic structure and so that's a, that's a problem. Um, so we're, um, one of the one of the thoughts on that would be to uh, to, to essentially put a hole in it, perhaps uh, at a point where you couldn't see, and, and, and allow it to uh, to lower its level through by by having having it piped out. And um, at this point, I don't know what's what's going to happen, but it's uh, it's certainly under contemplation. Um, the park is working on its general management plan. Uh, the pool is an important component of El Moro's history and its character and 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 and, and the theme. Uh, so um, discussions about the, the dam and, 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 and changing the water level are, are, are part of that. So um, I don't know, stay tuned. We'll see. <laughs> Any other questions? I've, I've got one more. Doug, you mentioned the spectacular prehistoric um, pet petroglyphs out there. Uh, presumably those were pecked into the this sandstone. Is there any difference in the rate of uh, weathering of those that is observable or, or even speculated on compared to the historic inscriptions, just in terms of the different uh, technique of, of making them? That's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> Which you hadn't thought of. Uh, well, yeah. Hmm. One thing, one thing I, I did think of when you mentioned the, the Pen Long um, glyph, mm -hmm. the, the E Pen Long glyph is. Um, is in such pristine shape, and it doesn't look like it's wearing much. Mm -hmm. And it may share a characteristic with the prehistoric glyphs in that it appears to be slightly angled towards the sun, which may be keeping those panels drier, drier. than the rest, right. which would reduce the which would reduce the, the dissolving of the, the matrix between the sand grains. Right. Um, that's kind of the only thing I can think of. Yeah. Um, but that wouldn't explain the preservation that's that's has been so excellent on the north face, where literally the sun almost yeah. never shines. Right, and it's hard to say. You know, hard to say what we've lost in terms of petroglyphs. Like at at the North Point, uh, there's in Nine Pine Cove, uh, kind of around the corner from Sitgrave's inscription, there are a lot of petroglyphs that are also in pretty fine shape, but they get a lot of sun, afternoon sun. But um, the change we see there, there are also pictographs there, and um, uh, some of them are almost almost completely obliterated by clay wash, um, completely covered by that, and that's you know just coming down from the upper portion. So there is you know, a fair bit of change there to those. It's actually a great question, and the Onate panel is going to be a perfect one to, to study in that because the, the ancient glyphs are, are still very, very, yeah, very sharp, very clear. and I suspect the Onate glyphs will probably follow the same pattern. Yeah. Other questions? Well, I want to thank uh, our speakers tonight, thank all you.